Hi, it's Katrina. Number 10. The Barbarian Invasions There were a lot of different ways in which the Roman Empire gradually collapsed, but if it hadn't been for the Barbarian Invasion starting around 200 BC, they probably wouldn't have collapsed quite so violently. The Barbarians were the Germanic people who lived outside the Western Roman Empire's borders and started moving into Roman territory. These were tribes who wielded battle axes and originated from the coast of the North Sea near Viking territory. They were descendants of the Corded Ware culture, a great people who lived in obscurity up until they suddenly didn't. The Germanic people had the disadvantage of not belonging to a single major civilization. Their people had been crushed during the Iron Age by the Celts and the Illyrians, and over the years they had become little more than nomadic bands. But by 200 BC, their numbers were increasing. The climate was getting worse in the north, and it was time for them to move to better lands in the south. Before the true invasion started, the Roman Empire had already been more or less taken over by the Germanic people. They were already part of their society as immigrants. Many of them were recruits in the legions, captured and forced to be slaves in the Roman army. Even the emperors had bands of barbarian mercenaries to protect them. Slowly, the barbarians encroached on the Roman borders. They appeared in Carinthia in 113 BC, then made it to the south of France, and finally into Italy in the year 102. But these were just fringe groups, small pockets of the population who moved in and settled down. It wouldn't be until 150 AD, when unrest among the tribes that lived all along the Roman borders started a war. Rome found itself surrounded by those countless hordes that had taken root along their edges. And before anyone could really stop it, Rome was finished. France was occupied by the Franks, the Saxons were in Britain, the Vandals were in Spain, and the Goths descended on Rome, signaling the beginning of the end of the empire. Number 9. The Rise of Christianity Believe it or not, the rise of Christianity was directly responsible for at least some aspects of the collapse of the Roman Empire. In fact, this may sound a little familiar, but historians say it was the introduction of Christianity and the loss of traditional values in society which fractured Rome beyond repair. Scholars can't agree on the exact steps that Christianity took to become a global religion. It's believed that in the province of Judea, within the Roman Empire, there were only about 1,000 Christian believers. The religion then grew at a rate of roughly 3.4% every year, compounding each year until it completely took over. By the end of the year 200, Rome was about half populated by Christians, and this was when trouble began. Half of Rome was Christian and the other half was still pagan. This caused conflict and violence and made society weaker. But it wasn't just a population divided, it was the emperor pushing down on them too. Constantine the Great, Roman Emperor from 306 to 337 AD decided he would eradicate paganism. His efforts to convert the entirety of Roman society led to strife, misery, and general unrest. He basically pressured the entire empire to give up the old gods they'd been worshipping for thousands of years. And it worked. If you were practicing paganism in the time of Constantine, it usually ended either in death or being tortured until you converted. There wasn't really a choice. Either you changed religions or you became the enemy. Of course, other factors such as plague and disease also helped encourage people to convert. Number 8. Too Many Emperors There were too many emperors in Rome and there was a lot of turnover. Emperors didn't last very long, which didn't help with stability. In fact, historians say that Roman emperors had a higher chance of dying from a gruesome death than a gladiator. Every gladiator that walked into the arena had a better chance of surviving to old age than a Roman emperor did of surviving his first year of rule. From between the years 14 to 395, 43 out of 69 emperors died violent deaths, either slain in battle or assassinated. That is a whopping 62%. Here are some disturbing examples. Emperor Publius Septimius Geta died in the year 211 at 21 years old when his brother had him slaughtered in his own mother's arms. Then his brother, Caracalla, was murdered six years later while using the bathroom on the side of a road. Marcus Aurelius Commodus was another famous emperor who died in 192 after a wrestler was sent to strangle him while he took a bath. Caligula ruled for four years, Tacitus six months. Didius Julianus ruled for two months and six days, 
The list goes on and on. Basically, being a Roman emperor was playing Russian roulette. The average ruler lasted about eight years, and when the fear of death lay that close, it was hard for a lot of these guys to take care of their empire when they couldn't even keep their own heads. Number 7. An Empire Divided When the Roman Empire split in half, it sealed its own fate. The division changed Roman life and government forever. The government began to have some major issues ruling the vastness of its territory. This was happening while the barbarian tribes were slowly funneling into the unclaimed lands at the fringes of the empire. It was a huge problem, but the Romans really didn't have the resources to protect themselves. Their legions couldn't be everywhere at once. To fix this problem, Emperor Diocletian divided Rome into two halves in the year 286. This was already a time of serious instability, both internally and externally. And while it seemed like a good idea to have the Western Roman Empire with its capital in Milan and the Eastern Roman Empire with its capital in Byzantium, what would become Constantinople, it didn't work out. At least it didn't work out for the West. Instead of functioning as two halves of the same empire, they just became their own empires. When the barbarian hordes descended on Rome in 410, Byzantium did nothing. The West collapsed in 476, yet the Eastern Roman Empire, also known as the Byzantine Empire, would live on until 1453. And now for number six, but first it's shout out time. I want to give a big shout out to Gabriel Solomon 111 and Lauren Metink. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe for more videos like these. Number six, greed and taxes. Greed and taxation played a big role in the collapse of Rome. We already know that the barbarians slowly chipped away at the empire until they were close enough to strike at its heart. But this was only possible because of the Romans themselves, who had been milked so hard by their emperors that they didn't really care what happened as long as they didn't die. A lot of this had to do with taxation. The wealthiest people in society profited off the hard work of the less fortunate. Rome's fortune was originally in the land, but this gave way to wealth through taxation. Each province made a tidy sum from taxing their farmers, and they kicked that money up the ladder to the big guys in Rome. The taxation problem was so serious that many farmers abandoned their land and sold themselves into slavery. The idea was that since slaves couldn't pay taxes or own land, yet had to do the same work as the farmer, it was less stressful to live life as a Roman slave. This grew to be such a big problem that Emperor Valens made it illegal in 368. Nevertheless, the damage was done. When your own people would rather be slaves than pay taxes, clearly something is wrong. Number 5. Lazy and Uncaring Citizens There is a theory that Roman citizens became lazy and apathetic to their own empire, allowing it to collapse. We already know they were being taxed to the max and that they were being forced to convert from their traditional religion to Christianity. These are two social issues that caused quite a bit of tension in Rome. However, it was widely believed that the civilization wasn't even worth rescuing at the time of Rome's collapse. Just like today, the majority of people believed they had been forgotten and squashed under the foot of their government. They knew that only the rich and powerful were prospering and it made them completely indifferent to the problems of the empire as a whole. If you're hungry, who cares what's really happening at the top? As the years went on and the empire got bigger and the emperors got greedier, the people suffered more. This was especially true for the Roman soldiers. When the men returned from the army, they would usually find themselves without a job and homeless. So it was that when the fall came on quickly, most citizens couldn't have cared less. They got lazy, they hated their own government, and they were looking for a change. Number 4. Failing Military In the beginning of Rome, her military might was astounding, but by the end, things weren't so great. The army buckled under its own weight and came crashing down with the rest of the empire. The first real major defeat came in the year 53 BC, when Marcus Licinius Crassus provoked a war with the Parthian Empire for no real reason. The Senate was opposed to it, but the emperor pushed ahead and started the war. 50,000 men sailed to Syria in the year 55 BC to wipe it off the map, but as they entered the Great Desert, an army of about 10,000 Parthians ambushed them. It was bloody anarchy. Over 20,000 Romans were massacred, and 10,000 were taken prisoner. 
Crassus was murdered, and the Romans were hugely embarrassed. And that was only the start. Then there was the disaster in the Teutoburg forest. Three Roman legions were ambushed and slaughtered by barbarian tribesmen as they tried pushing into their territory. Many soldiers died there in the forest, and this is considered a major turning point in history. The barbarians knew how to overwhelm and crush the Roman legions in the forest by using different fighting tactics. There was also the Battle of Edessa in 260 AD, after 50 years of almost anarchy inside the empire. There were 26 claims made to the throne, almost entirely from Roman generals. Since they were battling among themselves, this is when Rome's internal conflicts really started to show. In the spring of 260, the Sassanid Empire attacked western Mesopotamia, which was right at the edge of the Roman Empire. To stop the threat in its tracks, Emperor Valerian gathered 70,000 troops, barbarian allies, and traveled to fight back the Persians. But they got infected by a plague and couldn't fight. So Valerian chose to negotiate with the Persian ruler Shapur, and was immediately taken prisoner and shipped back to Persia. It was the first time in Roman history that an emperor was taken by the enemy. With their leader gone, the Romans surrendered without even putting up a fight. Number 3. The Fall of the Republic The Roman Republic was the first real-world democracy and the foundation for most democracies today. The Republic had a constitution, very specific laws, there were elected officials, and there was a ruling body of senators. However, the Roman Republic was complicated enough to allow corruption to spread. The difficulties expanded along with the Republic as it grew. Economic disasters, major government corruption, people with their own private armies, and the rise of Julius Caesar as the emperor. The Republic didn't have an emperor in title. This is what a lot of people don't realize. Before the Roman Empire, the Roman Republic thrived for 500 years as a legitimate government that didn't need a single power figure. But when the corruption got out of hand, that all changed. Government officials allowed themselves to be bribed to make decisions for their powerful friends. And once this started, everything came crashing down. The rich could do whatever they wanted, and the commoners no longer trusted the Senate. Then came Julius Caesar, who formed an alliance with Pompey the Great and Marcus Crassus, the guy who fruitlessly tried to invade Syria and died. When Crassus was gone, Julius defeated Pompey in battle and declared himself the Emperor of Rome. On that day, the Roman Republic was dead, and the Roman Empire was born. After leaving democracy and becoming a dictatorship, Rome never went back. Number 2. The Great Goth King in the summer of 410 AD, the great Goth king Alaric sacked the city of Rome. This hadn't been done in over 800 years. He brought his barbarian army through the front gates of the imperial city and plundered it like Rome was just some seaside fishing village. And even though the city did survive for nearly a century more, this was the end of the Roman Empire. When the great Goth king entered Rome, he pillaged, burned down the pagan temples, destroyed the old house of the Senate, kidnapped the emperor's sister, and treated the place like his own personal amusement park. After the destruction, King Alaric and his soldiers simply left. They didn't want to stay in Rome. They'd already taken everything and left Rome in pieces. And so they traveled to Gaul. Alaric died from illness shortly after. His brother Athalf took over leadership of the Goths, and his wife, after Athalf's death, married the Roman Emperor Constantius. Their son would later serve as emperor. The true fall of Rome came in 476, when the barbarian overlord Odecker rode into Italy and deposed all the remaining Roman nobility. Number 1. The Dark Ages To understand the consequences of the fall of the Roman Empire, we need to look at the Dark Ages. This bleak period of history began in 476, with the official collapse of Rome, and it continued for 900 years until the Renaissance. It's called the Dark Ages because many scholars suggest there was pretty much nothing in the way of scientific or cultural advancement. Europe was still recovering after the chaos of Rome, and it took them nearly 1,000 years to move forward with new technologies and new ideas. Basically, the Dark Ages were the stagnant years. In truth, there was a lot going on, it just wasn't quite as exciting as what had come before. Pretty much all of Europe was Christian now, and so for 900 years, most rulers were focused on building Christian empires. Without Rome to hold everything in place, 
The church in Western Europe became the only element of stability. It was the church that pretty much replaced Rome as the mother of Europe and dominated everything up until very recently. The term Dark Ages actually refers to the centuries after the fall of Rome where there was a return to the past with no records, as opposed to the light of classical antiquity. The classical era was considered to be full of literature and the arts, progress in science and technology. But the Dark Ages now is more accurately considered the early Middle Ages. But it does bring to mind times of war, destruction, and death. Thanks for watching. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already and come back soon for more videos on amazing history. Bye!